Hi, this is Dory Clark. I am here with ho the weekly Newsweek show, Better. And our guest this week is John Lee Dumas. John is the author of the new book, The Common Path to Uncommon Success. And you may also know him. He is a longtime top podcaster of the Entrepreneurs on Fire podcast. John, it's so great to have you here. Dory, it's always fantastic hanging out with you and just chatting entrepreneurship, business, all the fun things. So thanks for having me. Well, thank you so much. It's it's great to get to connect and uh, to reconnect because we've known each other for quite a while. Congratulations on your book. It came out just a couple of months ago. And the first thing that, that I'm curious about and would love to hear more about it, let's parse the title for a minute. The Common Path to Uncommon Success. It it sounds like it could be an oxymoron. If, if it's a common path, why is the end result success so uncommon? Break it down for us, my man. Yeah, so listen, I've interviewed now over 3,000 of the world's most successful entrepreneurs in the past decade, Dory being, of course, one of those amazing entrepreneurs. And I've recognized that every single one of these entrepreneurs that I've interviewed that have achieved what society and really anybody would consider uncommon success, that's financial freedom and fulfillment, they took a very common path to get there. It wasn't a complicated path. It wasn't a hidden path. It wasn't a secret path. It was a very common step-by-step -step path. And I'm a simple guy, Dory. I was in the army for eight years. You know, I tried law school. It wasn't for me. I tried corporate finance, commercial real estate, kind of before I found my way. Like, you know, I've taken a very common path in life. And then in entrepreneurship, I took a very common path as well. And it just kind of befuddled me that there just didn't seem to be a very clear step-by-step -step roadmap that was out there that just took the principles that yourself, myself, and the other 3,000 plus successful entrepreneurs that I've interviewed on my show have taken to achieve their version of uncommon success, financial freedom and fulfillment. So I said, that's the message I want to get across with the book, that there is a way to uncommon success. And it's not some crazy uncommon secret path. It's a very common path, but it's a step-by-step -step roadmap. And so few people, A, know about the roadmap or B, follow the roadmap once they see it. And I wanted just to make it as clear and plain English as possible. And so I sat down, wrote the book. I love it. And I have read your book. I think it's it's terrific, John, and has a lot of wisdom in it. I'd also like to greet all of the wonderful viewers who are joining us. Please feel free to type into the chat box and let us know who you are and where you're calling in from. We'd love to hear from you and we'd love to take your questions for John Lee Dumas, who is the host of the Entrepreneurs on Fire podcast and his new book, The Common Path to Uncommon Success. So, John, let's let's start to break this down a little bit. Uh, so, when it comes to these these elements, you know, the framework that you have developed in terms of what the common path looks like, give us a few highlights. What are the things that if somebody wants to be successful, they should definitely be doing? Well, number one, they're doing the right thing right now. They're consuming the right content. I mean, they're they're listening, they're reading, they're watching content from Dory from myself, from like other successful entrepreneurs. I mean, success do does leave clues, like very clear clues. And that's how I got my start 10 years ago. I sat down and I said, what exactly do I want to be in a year, in five years, in 10 years? Okay, who are the people who are currently there? Now, how do I go read their books? How do I go consume their content? How do I go follow their social media to see what they're doing day to day, the, the things that they're thinking? So that's just such a critical process. And everybody that's watching this right now has already started down that road. But there's a reason why chapter one, step one in the common path to uncommon success is discover your big idea. You need to identify what your personal big idea is because so many people in this world right now are just getting out there and they're trying to become pale, weak imitations of other people. If I tried to become the best Dory Clark I could be, I would just be a pale, weak imitation of Dory Clark, obviously. And the same if the roles were reversed. But some people in this world just see these successful entrepreneurs or people that are out there doing something. They're like, I want that success. Like, I want to achieve that. But nobody wants 
a pale, weak imitation of other people. They want the best, amazing version of you because you are a snowflake. You are unique. You are special. You need to bring your authenticity, your genuine amazingness to this world. And you do that by taking the first step for maybe the first time in your life, sitting down, going through the exercise and the process that I have in the book and identifying your big idea, like actually identifying your big idea, not a big idea, not a possible idea, a big idea that is tailored to you, to your genius, to your uniqueness. And that is the critical first step that frankly, most people die in this world without ever knowing what their big idea is. And that's just sad. I couldn't agree with you more, John. I think that is that is so true. And in fact, uh, my we get props here since I'm at home. Uh, my book stand out. The subtitle is "How to Find Your Breakthrough Idea and Build oh. a Following Around It." So we are aligned. Big time. Yes, and of course, it's an opportunity to mention that one of the stars of my latest book, Entrepreneurial You, is in fact Mr. John Lee Dumas. So I have a whole chapter talking about him and his adventures in creating the Entrepreneurs on Fire podcast. So John, to that end, uh, I, in a moment, I want to ask you more about that. But first, I just want to greet some of the wonderful folks who are tuning in for us. Anna is here from Vancouver. David from uh, Indianapolis. Gail is here from North Carolina. Lisa is here from New York. Jaime from Mexico City. Deborah from Minnesota. Carlos from Colombia. We're so glad to have all of you guys here and more. So, John, maybe you can walk us through finding your big idea because you were alluding to this you mentioned you you had a lot of you know what maybe we could call false starts you did a little bit in in real estate you thought maybe law school but no how did you personally come to the path that has brought you success yeah first i want to say um you know the love goes both ways with myself and dory she's one of the five individuals that i asked for a a testimonial to go on the back cover of my book and she graced me with that too so um she's also featured in the common path uncommon success uh, right on that back cover so thank you for that dorian and i did have a lot of false starts but listen the false starts they can all be looked at as amazing opportunities for learning which i looked at like i found a lot of things that weren't for me like a lot of things that i didn't want to do and, and that's an important part of life as well. So never like be a time traveler and like regret the past. Like just take that as, as a learning experience. Because then for me coming up with my big idea, you know, there I was 32 years old, about a decade ago. And I was trying to consume the right content, just like a lot of people who are here that Dory just called out are doing right now. I was trying to consume the right content. And I found some great content to consume. And it started with books, led to audiobooks, eventually led to podcasts. And I just fell in love with the medium immediately. I'm like, I don't understand why everybody's not listening to podcasts. I'm like, how can you jump in your car and listen to like the talk radio or like Miley Cyrus playing her same song like five times in a row? It's just like, what are you doing with that time? That's like automobile university opportunity. So podcasting just clicked with me because I knew it was free. It was on demand and it was targeted content. Three things that are just amazing when it comes to consuming content on a platform. So I knew at that moment that my big idea was gonna be a podcast, but that's just my big idea. Like I'm like, I know that I wanna create a podcast. That's a big idea. It really is because the podcast is a big undertaking. It's a show, like it's a production. It's a way of life. And I, again, I've spent now 10 years doing almost nothing except my podcast. So I can tell you that it is like a big idea and it's like an all inclusive and an all encompassing idea. But that's where we kind of kind of take your big idea and move into step two of the process, which is where most people fail by not taking step two of the 17 step roadmap, which is discovering your niche. Because my big idea was great. I did sit down and identify my big idea but guess what? There were thousands of other podcasts. So that just helped me identify what my big idea was. I needed to then discover the niche within that podcast or within within my idea that was actually going to be able to, as Dory you know, shared in a recent book, stand out. How am I going to stand out? And that was just such a critical, critical thought process for me. So I said, well, I know my I want my podcast to be a business podcast. So I niched down to the business section and I'm like, okay. That's a niche. There's now only a few hundred podcasts that are my 
competition. And so I said, well, what if I niche down again? And I niche down to business podcasts that interview entrepreneurs because I knew that I couldn't compete with just the hundreds of business podcasts that were out there. There were just too many. And then I ended up identifying that there were seven other business podcasts that were interviewing entrepreneurs. And I said, okay, well, do I want to be the eighth best podcast out there in 2012 when there weren't that many podcasts interviewing entrepreneurs? No, I don't want to be the eighth best. So how can I niche again to become the best, to become the best, whatever it is in that niche that I've identified? And so I looked at those seven podcasts, Dory, and I just asked a simple question. What are they doing wrong? Or what don't I like about those shows that's a common trait? Or you know, what could I do better? And I, I saw that the commonality with all seven of those shows, which were all very good, they all did once a week. And I realized that my complaints on those shows was that when I listened to an episode that I loved, I wanted to hit the next button and listen to the next one, but I had to wait seven days for it. And I didn't want to wait seven days. I wanted to keep getting inspired in the moment every single day when I was driving to work. And guess what? That was the aha moment. That was like, that's my niche. I'm going to become the first daily podcast interviewing entrepreneurs. And you know what that did, Dory? That made me, when I launched, the best daily podcast interviewing entrepreneurs. It also made me the worst, but it made me the only daily podcast interviewing entrepreneurs. I was the only game in town. So if people wanted what I wanted as a listener, which was a daily podcast interviewing entrepreneurs, I was the only show in town. And plus it was different, it was unique, it made me stand out, it was buzzworthy, it was all of those things, which is so important, not just blending in. Did Dory, did Dory Clark write a book called Blending In? Of course not, that's not what we're doing here. We are standing out. And so who's this, who's this crazy dude launching seven podcasts a, a week, 365 per year? He's crazy. And guess what? Because they thought it was crazy meant something. It meant the following, that I was building a barrier so high that my competition was going to be so low because nobody was willing to be that crazy. Nobody was going to be, even if they wanted to copy me when I was starting to have a lot of success, they couldn't because it was too much work. It was too unique. It was too different. I had too much of a head start. I built a moat around my business and I became the daily podcast guy speaking at conferences, on events, summits, this, that, sponsors coming my way, like the whole nine yards because I stood out because I was the only game in town. And if you don't build a high barrier with whatever it is that you're doing in this world, you have a low barrier. That means you're going to have a lot of competition because when it's easy for people to copy you, they will. And then everybody loses because everybody floods into the same thing and saturates the market and nobody wins and everybody loses, but that's not going to stop them from copying you. You've got to create such a high barrier that you have such low competition, or in my case, no competition. And so you need to be willing to discover your niche within your big idea that makes you stand out. I think that's so powerful, John. And I can see in the comments, people are really resonating with with what you're saying here. Uh, I, I love this comment. Uh, someone says, squee, I just jumped in because I love this weekly Newsweek show with Dory. And then to see JLD, does everyone feel more energized just <laughs> listening to him? I do. So yes, we can all relate to that. I love it. So we have some great questions from our listeners, which I want to get to soon. I will just remind everyone, if you are enjoying this conversation, please hit the like button and hit the share button so that your friends and colleagues can benefit from John's wisdom as well. If you want to make sure that you never miss an episode of the daily Entrepreneurs on Fire podcast, check out eofire.com and you can subscribe. That is how to do it. And if you want to make sure you never miss one of our weekly Newsweek shows, go to doryclark.com and you can subscribe to my newsletter and you will get reminders. So all kinds of good stuff. So we had some questions come in, John, that I, I think uh, are on a lot of people's minds. So this is a, a great one. Um, it is, uh, Lisa wants to know, is there a risk of someone becoming too niche or specialized? How do you kind of thread that needle or how do you think about that? It's impossible to become too niche because here's the reason. You need to become 
unbelievably as specific and niche as possible because you've got to put in the reps. You've got to learn. You've got to say, hey, what am I even doing in this world, in this niche? What am I trying to solve here? And you're going to make mistakes. You're not going to be good. I was a terrible podcast host for over a hundred plus episodes. I mean, I was getting a tiny bit better every single time I interview somebody, but I mean, just a tiny, tiny bit better every single time. It's going to take you a while to get good at something. So, hey, why not niche your face off? Get down to something that's this tiny little niche, make your mistakes down there, put in the reps, learn, get a couple raving fans down there that you can have in engagement and conversations with to learn what they're struggling with. Because guess what? Once you're so incredibly niched, you're not corner, you're not pigeonholing yourself, you're just niching. Then you start to broaden out when and if you're ready. And you may find two niches up, three niches up, that you're at the perfect spot and you stay there and you lock step and you crush it at that area. For me, I had the unbelievable niche of just a seven day a week podcast. There was nothing else that I did. But then as my business grew, I started adding more team to my, I started building a bigger team. I started adding more things to my plate. I became you know, a speaker at the biggest conferences and um, entrepreneurial events around the world. I started releasing physical products like my journals and now my book. I've released, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, the biggest like podcasting course and community in the world, Podcasters Paradise. I did webinar on fire. I was doing all these other things, but only after I had established my first niche way down there at the bottom. So you cannot niche too much. I love that. That's that's really interesting. Thank you for that, John. And something that that I think is an interesting question. You've now been doing your podcast for for nearly a decade, as you mentioned. Every single single day, you're releasing episodes. That is an enormous volume of work. I am curious how you keep up your interests. Anna says, "Where do you find your inspiration?" Uh, and I just want to append that. After a decade of doing this, how do you stay inspired with these topics? This goes back to what we talked about at the beginning is your big idea. My big idea was really this. It wasn't a podcast. That was like the, the, the medium of my big idea. My big idea was talking to inspiring people. Like that was at the core, at the essence, what my big idea was. I wanted to have amazing conversations with inspiring entrepreneurs. That's what I wanted to do because I'm an extrovert. I identified my big idea. I love talking to people. I love having conversations. I love answering questions. I love asking questions. I'm curious. I love business. I'm just you know enamored by the stories of how entrepreneurs got to where they are. To me, it's like candy. Um, I just love that and I've never stopped loving it. So whenever I get anybody on my show, it's a little shot of dopamine because I'm just like, yes, I get to hear an amazing story from an amazing person. And I get to ask the questions that I want to ask and I get to share it with my audience. I know it doesn't hurt that, you know, the result of all of this is a business that makes multiple millions of dollars per year called Entrepreneurs on Fire. So like that all together, you know, has allowed me to really just identify that I'm still doing what I love. I'm running a business that I love and that is thriving. And what else would I do that would give me this kind of joy in life on the business side of things, on the work side of things? And the answer is nothing. That's really powerful. I, I, I may may we all achieve that. I, I think that's uh, that's really terrific, John. So I, I'm curious. A question that came in, which uh, is is one that a lot of people might be wondering about. You started out by talking about finding your big idea. In many ways, that may potentially be connected, not necessarily, but it may be connected with a question around what our passions are. And Vincent from Dublin uh, wrote in. He's curious. What would be the one key question that you'd ask someone who's just not quite clear on what their idea or what their passion is. Do you have advice for someone in that situation, John? It wouldn't be a question. It would be a statement. It would be that you've never sat down and gone through the process of identifying your big idea. You've never done it. And that's okay because most people haven't. Life is busy. You're jumping from one thing to the other, putting out one fire after another, You know, trying to juggle a million things. You're a human being. We all are. But it's time to sit down, read chapter one, and for the first time in your life, identify your big idea. 
All right. So it's it's really just a a process of being methodical, it sounds like. It's not like waiting for inspiration. It's actually sitting down and, and really doing the work in a structured way, it sounds like. That's great. Excellent. Well, John, a question that I have for you. So your the subtitle of your book is, uh, so the book is The Common Path to Uncommon Success. Your subtitle is A Roadmap to Financial Freedom and Fulfillment. And so along those lines, obviously, we have just come through a crazy time in our history with the pandemic. Uh, it's a time when some people did really well, surprisingly well financially. A lot of people had hardship. They may have lost their jobs. Their businesses may have been disrupted. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit specifically about financial advice. If someone wants to earn more money, maybe they've had a, a challenging year, what would be a tip or some tips that you could offer someone who really is seeking financial freedom now? One thing that I've, I've identified, you know, beyond the fact of just interviewing 3,000 success, successful entrepreneurs, but running communities that have, you know, thousands and thousands of people who are on that beginning stage of their journey, is they never honestly sit down and even think about the basic sentence. And what the basic sentence is, are you providing a real solution to an actual problem? And when people are like, John, I'm struggling making money, like, I, I want to start making this and do that, like, how do I start? I'm like, well, explain to me the solution that you're providing to a real problem in this world. And they can't, they can't even say a thing. They're just like, well, I, uh, and they stutter for five or six minutes. And of course, nothing comes out of their mouth that's coherent. And it's just like, okay, so you are looking to have people who worked hard to earn money, hand their money to you, and you can't even yourself let alone the people that are giving money to you, but you can't even yourself eloquently say what solution you're providing, not just to a problem, to a real painful problem. And if you just keep things that simple, I mean, there's a lot of specific strategies and tactics you're gonna hear in a million different places. None of them will work if you don't start here, none of them. But if you provide the number one best solution to a real problem in this world, People will beat a path to your doorstep because people want the best solution to their problem. The second best solution through infinity, they're gonna ignore those because nobody cares about the second best solution through infinity. They want the best solution to a real problem that they're experiencing. So until you can look in the mirror and honestly and eloquently make that statement of what solution you're providing to a real problem, you are going to struggle. I think that's a, a powerful observation. Thank you for sharing that. And if you're just tuning in, we're here with John Lee Dumas. He's the author of the new book, The Common Path to Uncommon Success. He's also the host of the well-known podcast, Entrepreneurs on Fire. So you can learn more and subscribe to it right there. And if you're interested in making sure that every week you tune into our Newsweek Better program, follow me on LinkedIn, doryclark.com slash LinkedIn. You can subscribe to the newsletter there as well. So feel free to type your questions for John into the chat box. We'd love to hear from you. So John, I can imagine that, you know, there's probably some people out there who are listening and they say, well, you know, you started out by talking about niching down, you started a podcast, but also John, when you were doing a podcast, it was early days. There weren't that many podcasts today. There's so many podcasts. There's so much more competition. And one could probably make that argument for all kinds of things. If someone's feeling a little bit churlish, maybe a little bit skeptical and they say, oh, but you started early. So it was easier. What what would be your response to that if uh, if someone's a little bit skeptical around the question of finding the big idea and the niche? I'd say you're right. I did start early and you definitely did miss the boat on a lot of things. Um, the reality is first mover advantage is a real thing. And if you're thinking about starting a podcast today, you're not going to be a first mover in any sense of the word. Now, does that mean you can't have success? Of course not. You just need to make sure that you just do what I shared in the last um, little soliloquy, which is identifying a major solution, a, uh, a real, real problem, a major pain point, and creating the best solution to that. If you can say, my podcast is going to be focused on 
this one major pain point, and I'm going to be the best solution to that one major pain point, you are going to win as a podcaster, as an entrepreneur, as a business person. Um, there's a fantastic podcast that I just recently started listening to that I'm convinced is the best podcast on sleep. Why? Because they decided to become the best podcast on sleep because not that many people were focusing on sleep in the podcast space, but they did and they're crushing it and they're taking all of the cookies in that area, in that space. And they're also taking all the rewards as well. But also like, why do you want a podcast? Like, is that even what you want to do? Is that even a, a, a a medium that's for you like you've missed a lot of other boats over the years you've missed instagram you've missed meerkat you've missed clubhouse you've missed all these things so instead of like you know complaining and like regretting the past of like i missed this i missed that you need to say well what are my skill sets at what do i want to do what fits within my big idea and then what's coming what's coming next like what is just over the horizon there's always something just over the horizon. I mean, for years, I was like, there's going to be something that comes and is going to start to eat into the podcasting space. People are like, what could that possibly be? And I'm like, I don't know. If I knew, I'd create it. And then a year ago, up comes Clubhouse. And now Clubhouse is here and people had jumped on there early and crushed it. Like, I could have jumped on Clubhouse early and crushed it, but I didn't want to because I've already built my business in my platform and my, you know, financial success off of my podcast, I didn't need to grind it out in Clubhouse because that's a live platform. I didn't need to grind it out and bust my butt to just like try to claw my way to the top of that. Like I did 10 years ago in podcasting, claw my way to the top by just outworking everybody else. I wasn't willing to do that with Clubhouse. So you weren't even going to be competing with people like me. You would be competing with other people who hadn't yet made it. But guess what? Now it's too late for that. Now people have crushed it in Clubhouse. They're at the top. They're part of this creator fund. They're getting paid. They're making tons of money. They're doing all these things. So you missed it again. But what's the next thing? And are you going to be willing to work hard? I think it's it's well framed. I mean, we're 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 all constantly missing things. Uh, but also, even even today, I was being interviewed on a, a podcast, and someone was asking me about online courses and how did I get into online courses so early, and how did I know? And uh, and the the truth was, I, I said to him, when I got into online courses, it felt late to me. But it's just, it, you know, now it seems like I was early because time has has marched forward. So getting started is is so important. I think you raise a really great point, John. So one of the key themes that I'm hearing in all of this is about discipline and execution and really doing the work. I'm curious, when it comes to any rituals or habits, how do you actually motivate yourself? And, and are there specific habits that you've worked to cultivate to get all of this done? How does how does that and the concept of discipline factor into your success? I'm just a big believer in winning tomorrow today. So my day for tomorrow is planned out today. So I know when I wake up in the morning, exactly what I'm doing step by step. I am disciplined. And when I look at disciplined as a word, to me, that means I am a disciple to a plan of action. I have a plan of action every day and I execute upon it. Now where I'm out of my business, some days that is sit by your pool and do nothing. Because to me, that's what I wanted to do that day. And I've earned that right 10 years into my business to have a lot of days like that. But back in the grind, every day had every hour block accounted for, doing something that was going to move my business forward. And that's being disciplined. That's being productive intraday. And of course, that's being focused. So interesting, John, we probably have time for one last question. And this is something I'm personally curious about, because I, I feel like it's often difficult if you have been grinding for so long to actually know when and how to hit the off switch. What was the point where you actually started to feel comfortable uh, taking your foot off the accelerator just a little bit? How did you know that that was the right moment where that was okay? It was more a personal journey. So it was about five years in um, to my journey where I realized that my life was a little out of balance and I was you know, putting too much work and effort into um, work and not enough work and effort into health and wellness. And it showed, it, like it showed in my like weight, it showed in my energy, it showed in my like, like happiness levels. 
their balance just wasn't there. And that's when I've, for the past five years, been on a very intentional journey to correct that balance. And now I'm actually going on the other end of things, which is I'm leaning much more towards health and wellness than I am towards business and work because I don't, I don't think you can ever go too far in the health and wellness direction personally, as long as you're doing the right things. <laughs> um, and as long as your business, you know, is not imploding, then, you know, you can make those decisions on a case by case basis. So like right now, as we're talking, and this is one reason why I'm like not in EO fire studios is because I'm on a 17 day wellness retreat in Santa Rosa, California, where I just finished a 10 day water fast. Um, that is correct. Only water, nothing else for 10 days. Um, it was fantastic, by the way, you don't have any hunger from days four through 10. And, um, you know, lost 21 pounds, like I haven't been this light since 17 years old. I'm now 41. My energy and mental clarity were there all week. Like it was great. Now I'm in this refeeding stage, which is amazing. Um, because I've, you know, started to really tip the scales of balance. And, you know, I've for a long time now been well over 50, 50. I'm now more like really 70, 30, 80, 20 on the health spectrum to business. Um, because frankly, you know, I love what I do for entrepreneurs on fire, but I found in business and on the financial side of things, like I found enough, like I found what enough is for me. And, you know, you know, currently my business is bringing in a couple million dollars a year. I live in Puerto Rico, so I don't pay crazy taxes like everybody else does. My Dory, you know, I'm, uh, I'm here just paying a flat 4% tax on all the income that comes in and um, getting to keep the money that I make. So it's going to allow me to say, you know what, instead of having to work twice as hard for half as much, I'm just going to work half as hard for twice as much. And then I'm going to focus all that extra time, energy, and bandwidth on not growing my team and doing more ad spend, and do, like all the things I could do. And if I wanted to do that, I'd be doing it, but I don't, I want to focus on other things because I found what enough is. But again, I know what my core is. I'm still passionate about the core of my big idea. I'm not, for the, I, I can't picture a time in the foreseeable future. I just signed a, a seven figure two year contract with HubSpot. So I'm not changing my podcast anytime soon, believe me, but I can't picture ever straying away from the core of what I love doing, which is interviewing or being interviewed by incredibly amazing, inspiring, successful human beings. Like, I love that. So Entrepreneurs on Fire is gonna continue going strong as a daily show. Um, I'm gonna continue putting out great content around that. But, you know, besides that, like that's gonna be my focus on business and then health is my focus on health. And, you know, I'm, I just feel fortunate because it wasn't like a health scare that like got me here. Like I literally just, I'm getting ahead of the game and I hope that I stay there. That is beautiful. And I think it's so important. If we're working toward uncommon success, we all have to get clear on what our definition is. So John, thank you so much for being here. Again, John Lee Dumas, he is the the host, the founder of Entrepreneurs on Fire podcast. Here is the URL. You can uh, sign up and subscribe and learn more. And his book is The Common Path to Uncommon Success. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And John, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Dory. Thanks, everyone.